Good morning. There's voices coming back at me. It's amazing. <laughs> we want to begin by saying that we respect and acknowledge that these lands on which we gather are the unceded ancestral territory of the Silks Okanagan peoples. We honor their chiefs and elders, and we grieve with them for all that they have lost. Their land, their language, their traditions, and their children. We light this candle, acknowledging that we have benefited from their losses, vowing to listen and respect their stories, committing to working toward a conciliatory relationship where the First Peoples are respected, appreciated, and honored for who they are. May it be so. Good morning and welcome. You can do better than that. Good morning and welcome. There we go. It's good to see everybody here today. Uh, my name is Bob Wallace, and I want to welcome all of you to this service here in the church at uh, Central Okanagan United Church. The first time we've actually invited just the general congregation to come back in 19 months, 18 and a half, whatever it is. It's a long, long time. We are so delighted that you're here. Uh, I'm here to help lead worship with my colleagues in ministry, Ivy Thomas and Linda Irvin, and my other colleague in ministry who's hiding out in the uh, hall out there, Cheryl Perry, who's helping to lead in Sunday school this morning. It is a delight to be here. Before I go through the list of all the people who are helping and do the other announcements, I wanted to share with you just a little bit about what it takes to run a virtual and a live streamed worship service. So just keep these numbers in your head for a minute as I talk about it. Online and in person, <clears throat> this morning, we have 10 people helping to run the programs. That's 10 volunteers. That does, in count, uh, that does count the folk who've helped you be seated here. We have four ministers, of course. We have three musicians, wonderfully welcomed. We have four cameras at this point this morning. We have eight computers on and off the site here to run the program. We're using between 14 and 20 inputs to the soundboard. So just think about that for a second and you realize that this, this project, this proposal, this worship is not just about one or two or three of us standing up front or leading in singing. It takes a whole host of people and we're grateful for them this morning just to give you an idea and to name them. Sophia Andreasi is online as our host on Zoom and Facebook. Lorraine Haladic is doing some spotlighting for folks who are online and actually for us here as well. Uh, John Whitehead is running the videos and the slides. Um, we have a youth lector coming in from the hall to do the scripture reading. Carol Postel will be online to read the adult scripture reading and to lead the prayers of the people. We have Cheryl Perry, of course. We have Sophia Chasen, who's out in the back area in Sunday school as well. Here in the building, we have Kim Dukes, uh, Mike and Greg and Ben, all at the back carrying on. Uh, carry, and of course, Burl Itani as our usher. We have, uh, it's just, it just goes on and on and on and on. It is really a community that produces worship on these times and days, so please, know that and as you leave the building or as you come into the building be very aware that um, we are grateful for each one of the people who help us to have worship today it is so important for us all there are a couple of announcements to make just to remind you that this afternoon at 4 p.m on zoom there will be a livable income forum and Linda Irvin has arranged this. Lois Wilson is one of, the mod one of the people on the panel. And there'll be a chance for some interaction and some questions and some comments with Lois and other people about this endeavor of our United Church nationally. Also to remind you that there is a board meeting on Wednesday for those of you who might somehow be involved in that 
auspicious crowd and uh, it will be not only in person but online so that we can do both a Zoom and an in-person kind of worship. It's, it's getting crazy these days, but it's exciting. And having said all of that, I guess one of the things that it strikes me is that when Jesus gathered his early flock of, of followers, his disciples, he did so acknowledging that they were a community. And so we gather today as a community, online and offline, and we're going to light some candles to remind us of how we are connected. We're connected to folk who live in different parts of the world and are parts of our sister congregations and people whose lives and livelihood are differently expressed. We are one community and we live in the light of Jesus Christ. May it be so. Amen. On this 29th United Nations International Day for the Eradication of Poverty, we come together as church to call to mind the divine community that God imagines for all God's people. A community of love, justice, dignity, and full participation a world without poverty. In Canada, nearly five million people live in poverty. One effort toward God's kingdom, or kingdom, is the call for a guaranteed livable income program. Together, together, may we reflect on the word and be moved into the world. We gather together as grateful people, singing Christ's word made new for this time and this place. We gather together to do all we can to live the creator's intention of community of right relations, of community of peace. We gather together ready to act as the spirit guides us with our seeking, our living, our acting. We worship God. We invite you in the sanctuary to leave your masks on, but you are welcome to sing aloud.
Friends, I invite you to come to prayer. Let us pray. Creator God, with gratitude, we come seeking a new word and deed for our time. May the passion of your Holy Spirit fill us that we might live Jesus' call to be true community, mending God's world, living right relations, and peace on earth. May it be so. Amen. beloved, no matter who or where or what we are, will you join me in a time of honesty, a time of opening up to who we are and what we need of our God. Let us pray together. We confess, Creator God, how easily we enjoy the abundance we have while overlooking others who have little or nothing. Holy One, you turned a few loaves of bread and a few fish into a banquet for thousands. Remake us from habits of selfishness and greed that we might share your abundance with all people, no matter their race, color, or orientation. Help us to share food for empty bellies, shelter for aching bodies, and to live with dignity and respect for each other. Hear us, gracious God, as we yearn to live as your new creation. Pour your grace on us that we might be healed. Fill us with your spirit of generosity and compassion. For we seek these things in the name of your child, Jesus. May it be so. Amen. And in the same enthusiasm we had as we sang, Here is my mother, let us share a prayer for wholeness. God be with us. Guide us and bless us as we gather today. God be with us as we search and struggle to hear what you are calling us to do. God be with us as we try to live out that which Jesus showed us was right. God be with us as you were in the past, as you are in the present. God be with us, guide us, and bless us. 
for all the tomorrows to come, may we be with God as God is with us. May it be so. Amen. Reading ourselves. A reading from Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus. Teacher, they said, there's something we want you to do for us. Asked them. They answered, when you sit on your throne in your glorious kingdom, we want you to let us sit with you. One at your right and one at your left. Jesus said to them, you don't know what you are asking for. Can you drink the cup of suffering that I must drink? Can you be baptized in the way I must be baptized? They, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, we will, you will indeed drink the cup I must drink and be baptized in the way I must be baptized. But I do not have the right to choose who will sit at my right and must it is God who will give these places to those for whom he has prepared them. When the other ten disciples heard about this, heard about it, they became angry with James and John. So Jesus called them all together to him and said, You know that those who are considered rulers today have power over them, and the leaders have complete authority. This, however, is not the way it is among you. If one of you wants to be great, you must be the servant of the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, he must be the slave of all. So, for even the Son of Man did not come to be served. He came to serve and to give his life to freedom, uh, his life to redeem many people. The good news to, of the gospel. Thanks be to God. Thanks, Charlotte. Now, with some help from a device that Francis loaned me, I hope that people are able to hear. Do you need an up more? Can you get closer? Can I be closer? Um, let's move the camera. <laughs> right. Is that better? I hope that's better. You can hear me, right? Mm -hmm. And hopefully the people in the sanctuary can hear me as well. Oops, there's even a little bit of back here. Well, I wonder how many of you watched some of the Olympics on television this summer? Declan, you did, yeah? Was there a favorite sport that you watched? You do swimming, so you were really interested in the swimming, uh, the diving. I like the races. Races, yeah. Anybody else have a favorite sport that they were watching? Um, I was actually on the gymnastics. Yeah, and, and hockey is a great winter Olympic sport, so we'll get to see that pretty soon, yeah. Anybody else watch the Summer Olympics? You know, they were called the 2020 Summer Olympics, weren't they? Uh, Marina, what did you watch? What were you glued to? The, the swimming as well? Synchronized swimming. Excellent. I love that too. Well, it was called the 2020 Olympics because they were supposed to happen in 2020, but they were uh, postponed, weren't they, because of the pandemic. And so they happened this summer instead in 2021 in, in Tokyo. And uh, I wonder if you can imagine for just a minute, maybe some of you have imagined before being an Olympic athlete. Has anyone ever had a dream and imagining like that before? Yeah? I think that was one of the Rockets because I was in the Olympics. Okay, just a professional a hockey player, though. That would be pretty exciting. Well, I wonder then, uh, Gregor, what do you think it takes to become an Olympic athlete? What do you have to do? I don't know, because dreams are kind of weird. Sorry? I don't know, because dreams are kind of weird. You have to have the dream first, don't you? And then what do you have to do to make that dream come true? I, I think he was talking about like a nighttime dream. Oh, okay. Got it. Yeah. And so what <laughs> kinds of things? I heard De Declan say you have to practice a lot. Yeah? Anybody yeah. else think? What else might you have to do to get to be good enough to go to the Olympics? Jonathan? Um, you have to practice a lot and go to most and go to yeah, you have to go to practices and games and competitions. You maybe have to win some competitions in order to be chosen because you're kind of the best of the best when you go to the Olympics. You have to like start. 
Great. Yeah. So lots of practicing for sure. Well, I want to tell you the story this morning of two men who uh, who went to the Olympics and they ran in the men's 800 meter race. So a running race. And this is one of them. I'm going to show you a picture of him. And uh, so people out there can see it too. Do you like but, the one in the front? Oh, yeah, he's the one in the very front. So do you do want it? to pass that around? Oh, you know who that is. That's right. His name is Isaiah Jewett. Very good. And he, I want you to just imagine for a minute being Isaiah Jewett and, and just go with me to the track on the day of the big race. He has worked, you have worked so hard to get there. Imagine yourself as him. You've worked so, so hard to get to where you've been, you've trained really hard. It's even been difficult to get here because of COVID and all of the restrictions and things like that, but you've made it and you are ready. You are ready to run this race and go for gold. There's adrenaline pumping through your body. Do you know what adrenaline it is? That thing that makes up, that happens when we feel really excited or even really scared, adrenaline. Yeah, so your body's pumped full of it. And you're at the starting line. Can you picture a runner at the starting line with their feet in the blocks and leaning forward with their whole body, listening, listening for what sound? A starting pistol to go, right? And you hear the, the starting pistol go off and you're running, you're off and you're running, you're running as fast as you can. This is the race of your life. And then suddenly you feel something behind you and you feel something touch the back of your ankle. And the next thing you're tumbling to the track and you're falling down and another runner is falling on behind you. Well, this is what happened to Isaiah Jewett and another, another uh, athlete named uh, Nigel Adams, Amos, sorry, Nigel Amos. He was from Botswana and he had won many, many uh, medals himself and was hoping to win this race. So the two fell on the track in the middle of this really important race. I wonder, how would you feel if you were Isaiah Jewett? Can you imagine how he would feel? What, Declan? I'm like fond of like, like, you know. Oh, yeah. Just, is that like such disappointment? Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah, you could feel really physically hurt, yeah shock that this could happen came out of nowhere jonathan you, could be a bit nervous. you might be nervous or yeah yeah we'll be angry. angry yes you've trained your whole life for this moment and suddenly you're cheated out of it i heard in Great. another story that, that there is a runner um from who was at the start of the race mm -hmm. but he didn't speak english so and he didn't understand the sign, so he thought he was at the end when he, but, but the person who was in second in line, he, he saw that he was slowing down, but he, thought, but he helped him. The story of it, by Gregor, because when the, what happened next, it was a surprise to them both when they fell, but what happened next surprised everybody who was watching the race even more because instead of just laying there on the track, uh, Isaiah reached out towards Nigel. He put his hand out and that's what's happening in this picture. I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna pass that around. He reached out and he said, come on man. And he helped Nigel up. And he said, we're going to finish the race. And the two of them put their arms around each other and sort of jogged to the finish line. They got there about a whole minute after the gold, uh, the gold medal winner ran over the line. So it took them a couple of minutes and, to get there, but they finished the race. And you know, the story that Charlotte just read for us this morning, Jesus's disciples wanted to be great. And they wanted to be sort of like on the podium with Jesus on his left and his right. And that's what they were talking about when Jesus interrupted them. And Jesus said something really startling to his disciples. He said, if any of you wants 
to be my follower, you have to suffer like I have, like I'm about to suffer. Suffering, the disciples thought, that doesn't sound very great. And Jesus said, if any of you wants to be first, be number one, you have to come last. Coming last? Well, that doesn't sound great or important, does it? The disciples thought. And if anyone wants to be great, they have to serve others and be a servant to others. The disciples thought being a servant doesn't sound very important or special at all. Aren't people who are important and special supposed to be waited on by others, served by others? So their reaction to what Jesus said might have been a little bit like the reaction people had when they saw Isaiah and Nigel crossing the line together. They, they didn't just give up. They, they, didn't, they weren't going to have a chance to stand on the podium and be the winners, the gold medalists, but they demonstrated by what they did, camaraderie and grace and forgiveness and sportsmanlike behavior. And in that way, they demonstrated true greatness. So we're gonna talk some more about that story that Charlotte read to us from the Bible about greatness. And we're gonna think some more about that in Sunday school this morning. But before we do, the adults in the sanctuary are going to see a video of some pictures of in-person Sunday school that's happened over the last few weeks, while the other children, some children go off to a Zoom Sunday school breakout room that's led by Sophia Chason. And the rest of you are staying here with your leaders, Suki and myself and Marina and Charlotte. The Gospel reading today is a story told by Jesus called The Laborers in the Vineyard, or it could also be called The Parable of the Caring Vineyard Owner. The Gospel parable, parables are simple stories of everyday life in first century Palestine, easily understood by the people of the day. They are simple stories, but with profound meanings to shock us into new insights about God and what God requires of us. A reading from Matthew 20, verses 1 to 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. When he went out again about noon, and at about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around, and he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you, you also go into the vineyard. 
When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought that they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner saying, these last worked only about one hour and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I gave to you. Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? Here ends the lesson. And here is the wisdom. Hear the wisdom in that story. Let's just take a moment and think about that story. What are we called to do? Mend the world? She comes into the office. She looks tired. I invite her to take a seat. She does, cautiously. I see dark bruises on her wrist and her eyes. I ask, what can I do for you? She begins to speak, and the story is shared. She and her four children slept in a dumpster after she was robbed of what little money she had. It is a story I will never forget, difficult to hear, and not for the first time. A woman from a high-end Vancouver neighborhood called, my husband left, he had everything in his name. I have no home and I have no money. Overnight, she was homeless and penniless. A family, two jobs, living in a rat infested housing unit, never enough funds to feed their children and never enough funds to find a safe place to live. I was pained by these stories and I imagine that you would be too. God's family, hurting, hungry, homeless, what was I called to do in these almost impossible situations? How could God's world be mended? Some would say, oh, just pull up your bootstraps. Others would say, as a board member from the Hong Kong Bank said to me at a YWCA board meeting, oh, Linda, all they have to do is budget properly. Hmm, I thought. What's the educational moment here? I explained the kind of funds people received and the costs they had. And then I asked her, Vice President of the Hong Kong Bank, how would you budget? What can we do to mend God's world? We can walk away from the pain of the world, throw our hands up in despair, there is so much pain we could focus on, but we can focus on one thing at a time, as many of you are doing in the Central Okanagan United Church, in the work people are doing in community ministry. Today, we are focusing on the United Nations Day to eradicate poverty and how these two scriptures that have been shared this morning can help us find a way to mend God's world. Years ago, I was, part of a found, I was part of founding a group called End Legislated Poverty. We named that poverty is legislated by the regulations surrounding social assistance and other benefits. Here's a story. 
At one point on social assistance, people could earn a few more dollars a month for volunteering, a great way to build up people's confidence and work skills and provide a few more dollars that might allow for a better place to live and for sure, more food on the table. For whatever reason, that program was ended. Imagine what that did to the volunteer's life. This morning's parable begins, for the kingdom of God is like a landowner. The parable invites us to explore the relationship of the landowner and the laborers, just a small piece of the larger story. And I want to invite you to think about where you are in that story. Landowner, everyday laborer, midday laborer, late afternoon laborer. What does this parable say about mending God's world? The Jewish tradition has this story. When God, the Holy One, gets up in the morning, God gathers the angels of heaven around and asks this very simple question, a question we could ask each day. God would say, when God gets up early in the morning, where does my creation need mending today? Did you know and do you believe God instills in every human the desire to contribute to the common good and values and values each contribution? Instills common good and values all of our contributions. It is something that has kept me alive to the pain of the world and the passion to work for justice and equality. Back in former moderator Marion Perry's party's days in Newfoundland, Labrador, the baby bonus provided a little more income so she could wear proper shoes and not the 99 cents shoes found at the market. Family allowance allowed my mother a single parent after my father was killed, to provide food and a few extras. My father, and I shared this story some, some months ago, my father taught us about a few extras. Ice cream is a basic human right. I shared that story with the human rights lawyers in Vancouver. They were rather taken aback, but got the sense of what that meant. Ice cream is a few extras. It's a basic human right. And my father lived that belief in every way of his very short life. A guaranteed basic income is a major manageable way for our provincial and federal governments to ensure that all persons in Canada have boots, food, and a few extras, along with the basic necessities of life. And in this past year, we caught a glimpse of how that could work with the financial support programs developed because of COVID's interruption in our lives. Do you remember when the pandemic hit? We said, we're all in this together. But in fact, we were not. The inequalities that were hidden from us became exposed and many of us were shocked we saw firsthand the disparities that have long existed in our communities. Canada's social welfare system has failed to recognize the contribution of all its peoples, all its peoples. If only Canada's social welfare system could be as generous as the landlord who paid all the employees the same amount of funds, regardless of how many hours they worked. I have long believed and worked for a guaranteed income, now referred to as a livable income, but it's a hard sell, and I often wonder why. On the way here this morning, I was listening to CBC. I don't know if there's any other radio stations or not, but I was listening to CBC. <laughs> and I heard this person ask the question, how come we find it so hard to be a neighbor? How come we find it so hard to care? I hope you can come and hear what Lois Wilson and Barry Morris have to say this afternoon and Venus Batista. She's a member of our congregation. She will be the person that will be speaking about her lived experience. 
two jobs. There are over five million people living in poverty in Canada and many living without the necessities of safe housing and clean drinking water. Every time I see that on CBC TV, I, am, I hear there's no clean water in the north. How many years have our brothers and sisters in the north waited for clean water? I wonder why there is poverty in a wealthy nation such as Canada. Why is this happening? And why do we allow it to happen? Micah, my old prophet friend, calls us to act justly, love kindness and walk humbly with God. And I do try to manage. And I believe that you probably do so as well. And yet somehow poverty in Canada lives on and on and on. Is this how God wants us to live? Are we not somehow denying God's dream of justice for all? Maybe we get caught up in the idea that there is a first and a last, but I don't really think that, that we really do believe that deep down. Remember the story from Word for All Ages about the runners. They all wanted to win. That's why they were there. They all wanted to win. They all wanted to come home with the gold medal and share that with their country and all the people who helped them get there. But someone fell. And what happened? Dreams died. Remember what Jesus told the disciples. If one of you wants to be great, you must be the servant for the rest. And if one of you wants to be first, you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of God did not come to be served, he came to serve and to give his life to redeem many people. What happened on that track? People stopped and they helped one another. I don't know who won the gold medal, but I remember those people those two men coming across the line, and I thought that was the race. They helped their neighbor. You know, God has so arranged the body that the members may have the same care for one another as they did on the track. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Caring for one another is what it means to be a neighbor. Those laborers in the vineyard were waiting to be called to work. Family, family at home were waiting and hoping that they would find work that day. Some waited in the cool of the morning hours, others in the heat of the day, and still others in the late afternoon sun. And what did the owner do? He paid them all the same wage. You see, they all had the same need, a family to take care of, and the cost of food, and a home to pay for. And none of these expenses change just because you work less hours. Those expenses are still there. And still today, day laborers experience the same kind of weight. But I don't think their employers are as generous as the landowner in this parable. This parable reminds us that God's economy is to be accessible and inclusive, regardless of status, regardless of where we are at in light, regardless of how much we can contribute. Because people must receive what is required for them to have food on the table, a safe house to live in, no more hungry bellies, and no more homelessness. The landowner was generous. He paid the same wage to everyone, one, denarius, a Roman coin that was sufficient for three to six days of food. Not a bad wage, better than minimum wage in some parts of Canada. That day, the laborers went home knowing they could feed their families. In the COVID pandemic, there were some employers, like the landowner who did pay their employees fair wages, and some even raised those wages and gave much needed benefits. This past year, Canada has experienced that a guaranteed livable income is possible because we did it. We didn't name it, the governments didn't name it, but they did it. A guaranteed livable income replaces the systemic divide between the weak and strong, 
between the worthy and the unworthy, with a system based on our common humanity. It replaces a system built on employability, where the so-called deserving poor have to beg for an inadequate subsistence with a system that invests our taxes in the lives of all Canadians so that all may flourish and live with dignity. I have a friend in Red Deer, Alberta. He has chronic illness. He cannot work. He cannot stand for more than three minutes. He cannot sit for more than 15 minutes. He has to walk around. And WCB said to him, sorry, but you're able to work. No benefits. Now, isn't that interesting? And isn't, and God, what does God do about that? What do we do about that? We can all flourish in this world, in this Canada, with dignity. And isn't that what God and we, modern day disciples, need to do? We need to mend the world, make it right for everyone. We share this divine imperative of care and responsibility with other major religions of the world, do unto others as we would have them do unto us, the golden rule, is a faith principle of Jews, Muslims, Hindus, Sikhs, Buddhists, indigenous spiritualities, and most other religions. We are not alone in the mending of God's world. Great Spirit calls us to mend brokenness. What am I, what are we to do? The day laborers grumble, you have made them equal to us, how can this be? It can be when God reigns in our decision-making in business, and in our economy and in our church finances. Jesus is saying in this parable, there is enough for all of us to have a safe home, enough food and a little extra for ice cream. Our Canadian economy can end legislative poverty because there is enough for all to have a livable income. You wanna know the end to those stories? The woman who slept in a dumpster was reunited with family by the end of the day in Haida Gwaii. The woman who became homeless and penniless, a realtor found her a temporary home, a lawyer stepped in and the church provided funds. And the family, we were fortunate to find a place in a newly developed housing facility. Friends, this was a good ending to all those stories, but this does not happen for everyone. It does not happen for everyone. And I wonder why. My old friend Marion Party says, in God's world, when God's will is done, Jesus seems to be saying in this parable, there is enough for all to have a livable income. There is enough for all if distributed wisely to make Give us this day our daily bread, a reality. Give all of us our daily bread. Friends, may God's spirit touch you, revive you, and guide you. May God's wisdom call upon your hearts to act with justice. May God be with you each and every day as you take your steps in this world. We are not alone, God is with us and friends. We are God's beloved. May it be so always and always, amen.
My friends, there is enough. <laughs> There's more than enough if we but learn to share. We share our finances, and that helps to, uh, to do good in our small in the country and in the wider world. We share our gifts and skills, and that those around us who maybe don't have the set of gifts and skills that we have. We don't really think about that. As we stop and say hello to someone, when we smile, when we offer prayer, we don't really think of that as, as giving back, as offering of ourselves. But it is. And so I invite you to just take a few moments to think about this past week and ways in which you have offered yourself so that others might live more fully. Give thanks to God and pray that we may have many more opportunities like that. Let us pray as we listen to this prayer written by Susan Eagle. Creator of a grand cosmos and tiny infants, source of nurture and creation, you call us into relationship with each other. Open us to the cries of others and open our hearts to your persuasive spirit. May we acknowledge the needs among us and advocate for the fair distribution of resources. May we learn the politics of justice and adequacy that we may act with justice, love kindness, 
and move with humility. Today, we remember all who struggle to survive. We specifically hold in our hearts low income racialized communities who have experienced the most challenges with COVID. We pray for our spiritual political leaders. May they act with compassion as they are asked to give us leadership to implement a guaranteed livable income. Remind us, Holy Wisdom, that we encounter in each person, friend or stranger, Christ's light and love in the world. <clears throat> Grant that we may promote the justice and acceptance that enables peace. Help us to remember that we are one world and one family. <clears throat> this morning we pray for the family of Hugo de Burgess, the family of Telad Lamar, the family of John Paleta, the family of Valerie Ritchie, the family of Edward James Ard, Alma Burnett, Al Harrison, Angela Rem, Aoko Nishina, Barbara Sparrow, Ezra McKinney, Faith Campbell, Gail Avenko, Glenn McBurney, Hugh Campbell, Mel Sparrow, Michael Wilson, Paul Dickinson, Roger Heemstra, and Tilly Bauman. Amen.
Christ revealed, living and working in our world. And so we are called to mend God's world, and we are not alone. And remember that you are all God's beloved people. God holds you in the palm of God's hand and calls you beloved. God knows your name and you are on God's heart. With God, with God, and in the way of Jesus, with one another, we can make a difference in the world. We can, we can. Go now in the grace and peace of God. Go now in God's love. There's a spirit in the air. There's a spirit in our hands and in our feet and in our minds and in this Central Okanagan United Church. We can do it, friends, because we are God's beloved. Remember. May it be so, always. Amen. <laughs>